Let's get two minutes on the clock and your time starts now. All right, time is up, and hopefully you have some answers put through. Uh, so this here is a case of high output stoma, uh, and of course lots of things can happen. Uh, now, uh, probably important to note is I've, I've intentionally made this a, a three month after. You usually get a, a bit of high output in the period uh, immediately post-op. Uh, usually by about three months, things are starting to settle down. So I wanted to push things away a little bit from there, uh, but of course we have to acknowledge this is still a pretty recent operation. Uh, now, this, this could actually be um, further complications of ulcerative colitis. We've got an established diagnosis, and so this could just be plain old malabsorption due to ulcerative colitis. Uh, and that is one of those kind of sounds like a, a duck quacks like a duck. Uh, sounds like a duck quacks like a duck. Of course it does. Uh, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Uh, now, of course, then you have to ask, well, what are the things we wouldn't want to miss? And in a case like this, it would be malignancy, small bowel, something like lymphoma. If you're giving some kind of sensible uh, kind of option to acknowledge the malignancy risk, uh, I think you'd be getting two marks there. Uh, now, of course, this could just be simple infection. I think less likely uh, given the chronicity of it, but you can't rule it out completely. And so it would be something you would keep in the back of your mind. Uh, and of course, excessive fluid intake. So it's one of those a lot goes in a lot comes out kind of situations. Um, for uh, overactive stomas, um, we, we are looking at uh, volumes over uh, two litres per day. Um, so roughly, if we take a step back for a second, um, you get nine to 10 litres of fluid moving through the bowels per day, and 85, 90% of that's going to be uh, absorbed, uh, which leaves a litre and a half, two litres uh, to be reabsorbed by the colon. Um, this means you can normally expect one to one and a half kind of litres per day. As you're getting above two litres, though, you're really heading into that uh, kind of uh, higher output, more difficult to manage, more likely to see complications kind of territory. Uh, and so that's there's no actual fixed definition of high output, uh, which is why I haven't specified a particular amount here. I, I just wanted to say, look, it is high output. Um, but yeah, this is, this is something you have to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, now, uh, stress or anxiety, uh, well known, well established to have impact on bowel activity and so would be something you would have to uh, acknowledge as well, uh, particularly when this all seems to be relatively new, relatively big changes for him. So you'd want to explore that carefully. Now, there could also be surgical complications, be it something like an anast uh, anastomotic leak uh, or some kind of suitable example. Um, you'd be getting marks there. 
Uh, if you have a look at the side effects of mesalazine, you can actually get a high stoma output as a complication of that. Uh, you would also get marked by medication side effects as well. Uh, bacterial overgrowth is well known to increase the amount of um, uh, output, and that's, that's through changes to normal gut flora, uh, which will cause increased output. Uh, and of course, always remember your, your endocrine disorders as well. So adrenaline insufficiency, thyroid dysfunction, uh, all things that have been proven to, to have a strong correlation with stoma output. All right, now let's get to question number two then. We'll put two minutes on the clock and your time starts now. All right, time is up. Uh, now, this is one of those things as well that I, I think you have to, in some regards, force yourself to become exposed to managing stomas or, or dealing with patients with stomas. And if it's not something that you've done much of, um, I think it's important to try and find a way to expose yourself or do some reading up um, because it's incredibly common. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that um, if you don't know much about it, it's easy to kind of say the wrong thing or, or uh, make decisions that may not be in the best interest of the patient. Um, so just as important as actually managing the stoma output is all of the other things that go along with a high output stoma. And anyone with a stoma will tell you skin is just the number one priority. You've got to really try and protect that surrounding skin uh, because if that starts to break down, you're in a whole world of trouble. So discussing peristomal skin protection or uh, looking at appliance modifications to make sure the bags are sticking properly, you're not getting excessive excoriation or infection or breakdown uh, would be definitely, definitely worth two marks. Now, of course, we are losing high volumes of fluid. We're bypassing large sections of bowel. You'd be wanting to keep an eye on electrolytes, so uh, you'd be doing regular pathology. Tied into that as well, we've lost a large chunk of bowel here, so we need to also discuss nutritional support, uh, and I think it would be very, very reasonable to be referring to a dietitian for further advice or management options there. Uh, of course, this is someone who's gone through a lot, and so talking through the psychological support, uh, whether it's referral to a psychologist or um, just starting the patient on, cognitive behavioural therapy would also definitely get you marks. Uh, there are dedicated stoma nurses for further stoma care, and uh, again, that's referring to someone and specifying what for in particular. Uh, it's one of those things where some country towns have it a little bit more rough, have it harder, um, but again, this is such a common occurrence that uh, I know the larger rural centre where I am, we have stoma care nurses. So uh, find out what's available in your area. 
Uh, now, there are also massive support groups for this, again, being a very common thing, um, just not often discussed. Uh, and one of the bigger ones you'll, you'll hear about time and time again is the Australian Council of Stoma Associations, uh, which is kind of a, a body overseeing many other organisations. So it's a fantastic place to get into contact to uh, see what may be available in your local area. They can usually point you in that right direction. Uh, again, if you don't have much experience with it, you probably don't know, but there is a stoma appliance scheme uh, which gives financial support and access to consumables for those with stomas. Uh, the costs of all the consumables is absolutely staggering, uh, and so proper stoma care can be uh, limited by a patient's ability to actually afford all these things. Uh, now, this is something that if you haven't done, a stoma nurse or support group would definitely be linking them in with, uh, but it should be something you'll be involved with. Um, often needs a doctor's signature to, to authorise release. Uh, in the setting of high output stomas, to say, yes, there is a high output stoma, high output stoma uh, that's going to require extra consumables. Tied into all this, booking for regular reviews, really, really important uh, to make sure that you're then following up and making sure this isn't becoming a bigger issue. This is one of those things, the sooner you can jump on any problems, the, the much better the outcomes are for the patient and for yourself. Save yourself some grief and uh, just book in those regular catch-ups. Um, ideally, you would also specify timeframes to really be specific and concise. Uh, and so I would want you to, to specify, you know, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, whatever you think is going to be appropriate. Uh, and I think realistically, Given the slight ambiguity of the um, uh, stem here, uh, as, long as, you blah, as long as you specify some kind of time frame, you're going to get the marks. All right, coming up to the next question, the final question for case three tonight. Let's put two minutes on the clock and your time starts now. All right, so time is up, and uh, look, we've got lots of options here is the, the good news. Uh, and one of the important things is to, to look at, well, what are we putting in the first place? So um, important to mention that you're specifying adequate dietary fibre intake with high soluble and low insoluble fibre. Uh, if you just were to say increased dietary uh, soluble fibre, yeah, you'll get a mark. If you just say increased dietary fibre, you're not going to get marks. Um, because the, it's really, really important and I've unfortunately seen cases where people have been told it the other way around and made things quite difficult for the patient involved. Uh, so you want to avoid foods rich in insoluble fibres, that's bran-rich bread, cereals, uh, some fruits and veggies, uh, legumes, dried beans, uh, and you want the foods that are high in soluble fibre, so stuff like oats, rye, barley, apples, bananas. Um, there's plenty of lists out there if you want to know kind of what's safe, what's not safe. Uh, and the um, association I was mentioning before actually have a really nice kind of write-up on, on different options and different foods available. So uh, have a read of there if you're ever kind of stuck or not sure. Uh, 
Uh, now, of course, uh, high output stoma, we have um, different anti-diarrheal medications. Probably the easiest one to get a hold of these days is going to be loperamide. Um, you can use codeine as well, uh, and you can get straight codeine tablets. Um, it used to be wonderful to be able to get codeine linctus. Uh, unfortunately, no longer available, but there you go. Uh, so I think as long as you're specifying some kind of sensible option there, you're going to get a mark. Uh, there is a lot of evidence as well to say um, consider a probiotic to try and balance the gastrointestinal flora. As you're having that high output, you're going to strip a lot of your protective bacteria with that. Uh, you can reduce oral hypertonic fluid intake, so that's tea, coffee, water, juice, anything that uh, is going to kind of shoot through. Uh, and again, kind of then tied into that is uh, what are the other things we can put in there? Uh, and that's going to be sipping oral glucose or, or saline kind of solutions uh, as a fantastic little option. Uh, now, you can also use ranitidine or omeprazole. Uh, so ranitidine, 300 milligrams oral twice daily and omeprazole, 40 milligrams uh, oral daily. Um, you can use it intravenously as well, twice daily for severe cases. Uh, it has a pretty significant impact on stomal output. So again, the IV access is not something I'm going to be expecting you to do in general practice setting, but a, a trick to have up your sleeve if you're ever needing to know. Uh, but certainly oral ranitidine or oral omeprazole, um, fantastic options if your patient isn't on those things already for coexisting reflux or something else. Uh, so yeah, keep that up your sleeve.